Well, I mean, on the first one, I think, uh, yes, definitely, they, uh, you know, we, we do have a, um, a kind of a, a federation, a federal system that is still evolving. It has been uh, under, you know, in great trouble, you know, the, the highest, uh, the, the sort of worst part was 1971 when the majority of Pakistani uh, population, the Bengalis, uh, left us and became Bangladesh. Uh, and there is a problem in Baloch. They have genuine grievances, but they're, it's a very complex. And there's also the rise of Islamic extremism in that province. So it, it just makes it very complicated. But I think the the issue is that uh, that those issues on in Sindh and Baloch require a more workable more equitable federation. And that's a political process which Pakistan's political parties are trying to sort of get there. Uh, but on this issue uh, uh, of the religious uh, in growing, uh, re uh, growing intolerance, on the influence and impact of Islamic extremism, is something that is that is that that now requires a mega kind of a societal, so systematic, operation and changing of narratives, changing the direction of the country. And that is, uh, you know, a task that um, has been delayed. Somebody asked that whether there was political will. I think, I think there, there is political will. I mean, there is a, I mean, the majority of Pakistanis do not approve of, uh, you know, uh, the brutal violence and the brutalities. But I think at the same time, what they have, what has happened is that many of them, especially the youth, have been kind of indoctrinated to accept it as kind of, you know, not fully kosher, but kind of, you know, well, shit happens. Sorry for the bad language. So uh, this is the worrying part. And that has to be changed. Violence and, uh, you know, human indignity, uh, denial of human rights, denial of citizenship has to be an unacceptable uh, act in any society. And this is also very important for Pakistan's future democratic path since we are at NED. So because if you have the, if you have societal instability growing, if the minorities and full rights are not equally applied and, and granted by the state and constitution, then the democratic process is going to be flawed and going to be discredited in the in the long term. And so, you know, for the political elites, they really have to re rethink their strategy. On pressurizing Pakistan, I mean, really, you know, I can't really say much. I mean, I have to go back one of the days, okay? Yeah. This is live webcast. So, so I think that I, I, do, I do agree that um, not enough uh, engagement takes place. There's a lot of pressure. You know, from short-term things, you know, Pagani network, this network, that militant, that leader, OBL, blah, blah. But I think a more meaningful engagement, uh, uh, there is still room for that. Uh, I do not think that by penalizing or, or uh, you know, uh, sort of designing punitive measures against the country, you can get results because that's not going to happen. Let's, it's a real world. Uh, about the floods, I just want to correct that. I think uh, um, uh, your perception uh, needs a little revision because a lot of aid did go to the flood effectors. And, you know, given the scale of those floods where almost one-fourth or one-fifth of Pakistan's land mass was underwater, it was a remarkable feat to restore and rehabilitate their livelihoods. But yes, uh, the US aid predominantly has gone to the military. I mean, the, those are facts. And I think that is for, for the US uh, Congress and US authorities to review and see. Pakistan's land mass was underwater. It was a remarkable feat to restore and rehabilitate their livelihoods. But yes, uh, the US aid predominantly has gone to the military. I mean, the, those are facts. And I think that is for, for the US uh, Congress and US authorities to review and see. As far as to suggest. <laughs> <laughs> well, just to go back to the point I made about this uh, designating of Pakistan as a CPC is one way that we think it would um, help uh, refocus and elevate this issue in the bilateral conversation. It's not a punitive act, but it's one that's required by Congress, and the longer that it goes unmade, then we think it puts the United States in a hypocritical position. Um, 
There has been. Um, it's, it's usually tied to the release of the State Department's Religious Freedom Report. So that came out in um, uh, September, I believe, and they made uh, some CPC decisions. Pakistan did not make the list. Uh, so it's a conversation that we've had about how to encourage the State Department to make that decision. But there's some other easier steps, too, like this, um, this commitment to interfaith harmony. Um, we've suggested that the State Department make this part of the uh, strategic dialogue. Why not have a strategic dialogue, you know, with all these other baskets on economics and security and energy and on interfaith harmony? Pakistan is unique in that it has a, it had a federal cabinet position. Now it's a state minister position on this. This is a way to extend a hand to say, Pakistan, you're doing something that we appreciate. How can we build it up? Um, I'm reminded when the new um, minister for religious affairs, which now houses the interfaith work, his first trip abroad was to Saudi Arabia. And he, um, I, I can't remember if he met with uh, it was a Saudi government official or the uh, imam of Mecca, but he asked for Saudi government assistance to, to, to do interfaith harmony work. Um, you know, I think that's something if the Pakistanis were to invite, ask the United States, I would hope we would leave it that chance. We have so much to bring to that. And we could be such a natural partner with the Pakistanis on that in a constructive way. So, you know, we're saying a, a mix of things, some good old fashioned pressure, but also bolstering those people who want to do the right thing. We are unequivocally against the breakup of Pakistan, so I'll put yeah. that. That's no. We, I do not agree with that at all, um, to be very clear. Um, I think as far as this work, though, it's important that, I mean, you have people like Raza who, you know, almost paid with his life for this work. And, um, yeah, well, I think it's a little different in Pakistan. And I think it's a matter of how do we help those people, help those uh, folks who want to see a, a constructive 
progressive, stable future for this critically important country of almost 200 million people um, to reclaim that, uh, that vision that Jenna laid out of diversity and inclusivity. And I'm reminded that the white bar on the Pakistani flag, you know, it's got the, it's mainly green with the crescent and the star, but it has the white bar. The white bar was placed there to represent religious minorities. So, like, the very founding of the country has that integrated into its uh, DNA. I'm afraid that DNA is being pushed out because of these other forces we've talked about. Um, but I think we can't, you know, I've been criticized because of my writings of being anti-Pakistan. And I've said, if I was anti-Pakistan, I wouldn't do anything. I would just just let these forces continue to play out. I'm pro-Pakistan. I want to see a strong, stable Pakistan that can uh, respect the rights of all its citizens. Um, yeah, if I can just add to that, uh, I think all of us uh, up here are uh, pretty much against the the break of Pakistan. In fact, we want to see Pakistan succeed, and uh, um, you know, raising these issues is not to criticize, uh, you know. Um, Pakistan as a, a country or anything like that, but um, you know, just to ask for you know basic protections for its citizens, and um, uh, you know, um, ultimately these are these are questions and these are problems that the Pakistanis themselves have to to deal with and settle, and we can provide whatever support. Uh, we have limited leverage, um, and um, you know, uh, as our friend from the embassy stated, there are a lot of people in Pakistan that are working on these issues. Civil society is very active, uh, politicians as well, um, but there's this issue of impunity, and, and uh, you know we saw assassinations of uh, politicians, Salman Taseer of Shabazz Bhatti, um, and uh, journalists who speak out, like our friend Raza Rumi, are attacked, uh, and um, and uh, l lawyers defending blasphemy cases. Uh, Rashid Rahman, who's someone we had worked with. Um, you know, just uh, gunned down with impunity. So there's a chilling effect on, on society. On um, uh, and uh, you know, um, the, the, I guess the big question for me is like, how uh, you know, uh, how can how can we raise these issues? How can we strengthen those voices in Pakistan? Uh, um, because uh, you know, the other side has uh, you know um, no compunction about using violent means, and uh, even Shias who are being slaughtered are. are showing a lot of restraint, yeah. actually. I'm surprised. Um, and uh, we have to give credit to that, but also you know, find useful, constructive ways to support them. Yeah. So. I, I just a quick uh, addition to, well, thank you for. <laughs> I, I, obviously, you know, I think uh, that, uh, first of all, you know, this getting into why Pakistan was created, you know, it, this is a bit debate been there, done that. You know, it's been just, and Indians love to raise it because, you know, there is a whole perception of Pakistan being this art quote unquote artificial country and leaving India. But you know, those events of 1940s were very problematic. You know, Muslims did uh, feel under the leadership of Mr. Jena that not just their religious, but also their economic and political rights would not get the due share if there were no um, mutually agreed constitutional arrangements. And that process of negotiation and bargaining actually collapsed in the, in the 19, late 1940s, and hence partition took place. I mean, you know, Mr. Jaina had agreed to, you know, for the record on the cabinet mission plan in 1946, which actually did not want partition of India, but wanted more provincial autonomy. And by, uh, you know, the Indian Congress actually rejected that cabinet mission plan by the British. So. Partition became a kind of a, you know, it was both an accident, kind of, in a, in, you know, uh, of history, both and, uh, and inevitable, but also largely, you know, it does represent the aspirations of a large number of people who wanted more guarantees and freedoms. So, you know, I think it's a, I, I think this, this whole idea of Pakistan being this, on, this artificial, you know, it's a, it's a country of 200 million people. So please do think about us, you know, when you say it should break up, it should go through more turbulence and all, all of that, you know, and it's a, it's a country which is struggling. I think a lot of countries in the world, uh, Pakistan is a young country, are going through this phase. I mean, by highlighting all these issues, I'm not saying that Pakistan is like a kind of an, uh, um, um, you know, a, a, a figment from a, a, a horror film. But no, but actually, you, that you know, it has to be re restructured, it has to be improved, it has to be uh, better, you know, mediated for its young future, because the majority of Pakistanis are young people now. And, uh, but to add to what you said, I think um, 
I do take your point that, you know, this uh, moment of, uh, uh, you know, in this quest for us Islamic identity, obviously it was taken too far by Pakistan's elites. And I, you know, there you do have a point, uh, and I take it. I, th I think uh, Mr. Jinnah tried to correct it in, on the 11th of August in 1947 when he gave a clear secular vision for Pakistan. He said that, you know, you would be free to go to your places of worship and your religious identity would cease to exist and you would be a, an equal citizen of a country. Sadly, that this was not implemented or taken forward, and that's the, the kind of tragedy we are dealing with. I, I think, no, you're absolutely right. This is a major challenge. I mean, Ox has highlighted some of the issues, and there are many studies and many reports. You know, there was a uh, report by a Christian um, group that also looked at the uh, intolerance. But I think what is, uh, there has been the response from society is also lacking. I think that's a that's a tragic part. You know, we keep on saying the state did this, you know, General Zia did, the, the military did this. But you know, the societies, inter intelligentsia, the political parties, the intellectuals, the educationists, they all also have kindly played along, you know? So they are equally culpable in my view. And I think there has to be this major, uh, shift uh, in that direction. It is coming now. More and more people, especially the young people, are objecting to it. You know, if you read the Pakistani press, you know, and look, you look at the popular blogs, there's these young people in their 20s writing, well, you know, what are we uh, thinking? What are we saying? What are we teaching? And why, why it must change? And, and, and that's a positive sign. And I think there are countries which have reformed and improved their curricula. You know, so many examples from Latin America uh, and from other parts of the world are there where societies do. Uh, take the initiative and, and show kind of resolve. Great. Um, maybe we can go this side, um, Jenny. Hi, I'm Jenny Anderson. I'm with the Center for International Private Enterprise. Um, my question is, um, the recent protests led by Imran Khan and uh, <laughs> there was, there did seem to be, there's somewhat a positive outcome of these, that there was a heightened awareness or political awareness among youth, it seems, as well as um, maybe steps towards um, youth also wanting a democracy that delivers a little bit better. Do you see any opportunity right now with this sort of heightened expectation of youth to somehow channel their energy towards increasing tolerance? Uh, well, I mean, I think, um, yes, I think you're right. There were certain positive aspects, particularly this huge political participation by young people and their imagination being fired up with the idea of change and changing the system. And then also, you know, uh, Mr. Kadri, who uh, was, uh, you know, a partner of Iran Khan in those protests, is a kind of a more relatively more moderate cleric. I mean, in my personal opinion, clerics are all problematic. This is a very, you know, we, we do it for the purposes of, you know, policy, etc. But clerics are, are a problem <laughs> everywhere. So, but but he's he's uh, he's definitely somebody who shuns violence. He's uh, in tune with Sufi Islam. He's uh, uh, rejects uh, in public the Shia targeting. So he's a kind of a good role model. And they, they I think they, uh, the allegations that Pakistan Army was supporting these two, well, if, if it was, I'm very happy because they were, for, you know, for a change, supporting not a Salafi or a, or a Wahhabi, but a more modern cleric, so, you know, all welcome there. Uh, but, yeah, but I think um, that change, uh, sadly, uh, the opportunity is mixed because Mr. Imran Khan, who runs the Khyber Pakhtunkhwa province, which I mentioned earlier, in that province, the textbooks are being revised again to insert some of the stuff that was deleted by the earlier more secular government. But I think over time, and that is one of Pakistan's greatest asset and greatest hope for change, is that the median age in Pakistan now is about 22, 23 years old. It's a totally young country. It's a new country. It's a, and um, you know, there's lots of energy. There's lots of unrest. And what you see in Pakistan is also that pulsating uh, kind of desire to do away with the old structures. And I hope that. Uh, in this quest for change, in this quest for transformation, some of these more radical and worrying aspects will also be undone. Yeah, I mean, I'm, uh, I'm, in a way, I'm glad you brought this issue. I mean, I've been to the Chetagong Hills, by the way, 
and I know the, the, the tension and all of that. But I think, uh, you know, while we were discussing Pakistan, it is also important to uh, note and uh, highlight that there is a minorities problem across South Asia as a region. It is not just Pakistan. Perhaps Pakistan is a more highlighted, more kind of uh, severe version uh, with all the legal systems in, in operation, but whatever is happening in India, in Nepal, in Bangladesh, in, even in Bhutan, is, uh, is is quite shocking. So you know, there's, there, I mean, this merits a separate discussion. But uh, you know, I do uh, would like to raise this that I, that I think um, the problem has been that uh, a lot of these new states, new nationalisms, have not been able to define the idea of citizenship. And the idea of how, you know, like the uh, people in the hill tracts uh, in your country also have this, have some have similar de demands. You know, they also complain of exclusion, of marginalization, etc. And it is, it is, at the end of the day, it has to do with the idea of citizenship, how it's uh, imagined, how it's distributed, how it's negotiated, and how the state uh, actually enables uh, full uh, rights of any individual. And that's where these countries are still battling. I mean, in, in, in India, you see, uh, you know, very common occurrences, you know, whether it's the, the Christians or the Muslims or, the, or even the low caste Hindus. And similarly, in Bangladesh, you hear of many incidents now they are growing, uh, you know, so it, there's a regional dimension to it. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, you're right. I mean, I'm not trying to whitewash or present an overly optimistic picture. But I think uh, the, the reality is that, uh, as I mentioned earlier, you know, in a country of 180 to 200 million people, it is so difficult to generalize that the public is either silent or complicit. Because there are, the, I mean, if you look at social media, which is more, you know, digital media, and we were talking about it, uh, Wilson, uh, uh, before the, 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 the event, I mean that's a that's a kind of platform which is now being used by the younger people in Pakistan, and there are nearly 30 million internet um, internet users. And if you look at the reactions, and you if you look at the condemnation widespread, it does give you hope. It does it does show you that there are a lot a lot of people out there who may be afraid, who may not be empowered enough, but they do feel that this has to end. As regards the politicians, yes, they are afraid. I mean, clearly, you know, after Tasi's killing, uh, Mr. Shabazz Bhatti being gunned down uh, for for um, uh, wanting to amend the blasphemy law, there is a lot of uh, uh, fear. And the, and the politicians have misused Islam to gain political power. That's also a reality of Pakistan. Uh, but at the same time, there are there is now a realization. Uh, big, uh, you know, if, if if this genie out of the bottle is not handled, then it's going to consume all uh, the ruling elites as well as as events elsewhere have shown. Have they done anything to the to the yeah, to Salman Tassi's uh, murder? He has been punished, uh, and you know he has been sentenced to death. But he's gone into appeal at the high court. So, but he's he's building in the jail. Uh, at least, at least yeah.